So in this interview with uh, Jeremy Whitaker from a company called ShipBob, uh, we talk at first about some of the strategies he employed. He got started in the world of video as a uh, inbound lead account executive uh, at a software company. And we talked a little bit about the strategy he used and the techniques he used and kind of the results he got from incorporating video into his process. So uh, you'll definitely benefit from hearing that, a little bit more of the tactical how-to side of it. Um, but then we really get into you know, the, uh, the emotional hurdles you go through when you're getting started on video. So we talk about you know, how you gotta shift your mindset uh, from you to them and focus on the value you're providing to them rather than how you're coming across. And that was a big thing that helped him. But we even get into the idea that the, uh, you know, the ideal self that you portray to the world and then the real self that you truly are sometimes are different and, and video exposes them and you have to get comfortable uh, with that. So anyways, uh, it's a fantastic interview. Jeremy has a ton of thoughts to share. I really did enjoy having the conversation with him. So I really do think you will enjoy it as well. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, today, actually, I have a conversation geared up here with Jeremy Whitaker, um, who's someone who I've known for probably about a year now and always love and respect the heck out of him for the work he does professionally and the video um, that he's been doing as well. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about his journey and his experiences with video. Uh, but first, Jeremy, just tell people just a little bit about yourself, the work you do, where you work, all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks um, for inviting me to this to this podcast and the show, Jonathan, I really appreciate it. Um, in terms of my journey over the last few years, I've been having a number of different sales roles um, that combine things around outbound, inbound, closing. Um, and so now I'm, I'm handling some business development efforts for an e-commerce fulfillment tech-enabled company um, and ultimately excited to use video to engage, tell stories, um, and broker new conversations and, and set really qualified meetings. Um, so really excited to use video within that instance as well. I'm um, excited to go over um, how I'm going to navigate that journey, how I've navigated it in the past. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I, I, I met you, you know, maybe a year or so ago. Was that when you started using video or had you been using video before you and I uh, met? Yeah, yeah. Great question. I was um, <clears throat> in terms of like my journey into video, um, it really started in my last role, which was an inbound account executive role. Um, saw a number of leads that were coming in through the funnel and really wanted to find some ways, and additional ways, I should say, to engage customers and to get into more conversations, more discovery calls, which ultimately more demos and closes. Um, and so I was noticing that some of the clients were, were responding to traditional methods, email, phone, LinkedIn. Um, but one of the things that I was just trying one day randomly was recording like personal YouTube videos for people yeah. um, and making it private and just sending it to them as like, Hey, I made this video for you. Um, outside of work, I was working with um, <clears throat> some mentors. Um, and one of the things that they brought up to me was uh, platforms like bomb bomb. Um, and he told me about this idea of, of people who were, you know, using, <clears throat> let's say like very creative and dynamic um videos to engage prospects over email and so he sent me like these use cases and like this guy's blog who talks about how he does it um so i, I read through that and skimmed through it um and then from there i uh, was just like oh okay I'm, you know this is really great like i just did some sort of weird dinosaur way of doing this it took me about 15 minutes to make someone a youtube video and that didn't even get marked as an activity um so i'm excited to like find a way to pretty much automate this and scale this and you know, find new ways to tackle this. And so video was a part of a larger conversation that I was having around how to engage customers, um, how to, to drive more interactions. Um, and so <clears throat> from there, I just, you know, just jumped right in. I, you know, I just went in out of my own pocket and just reached out to, um, and I guess, an SDR, BDR, uh, set up a discovery call to like make sure it was aligned with uh, what I what I need to do with my sales process, um, and from there, uh, it was a matter of you know sending some initial videos, getting feedback from you, um, going over those training materials, establishing a foundational base, um, and then from there, pretty much started to use it to evolve into some un unorthodox like use cases of video that yeah. I had in my role. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a great way to really engage customers and, and um, engage in a lot of different types of storytelling. That's cool. 
Yeah, so for some context, um, BombBomb is a, uh, an email software company that allows you to send video emails. That's where I work and that's how Jeremy and I met. So for any of you guys listening and he, he, he talks about BombBomb, that's what we're talking about. It's the way to record videos and send them out through an email. Um, and we met because I was actually the account executive who uh, helped Jeremy out uh, getting his account. So he was an inbound lead for me that I responded to and sold. And then I actually started helping him uh, how to, you know, respond to and sell more of his inbound leads at the company he was at. So, and that's, it's, you mentioned that, you know, unorthodox ways of using video. And I remember that is something that, that always kind of uh, struck me about your use case for video, Jeremy, is that every time I check in your account, I'd see new stuff there and I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> you know? Um, so adding that a little element of creativity, I think helped you do, uh, do well for sure. Yeah. And I can definitely um, elaborate on that if you want. Oh yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little more about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess when I started, <clears throat> a lot of them were the use cases of like introduction, like this is who I am and kind of just using it to establish some very, uh, foundational rapport, um, but kind of <clears throat> some of the particular use cases that I've seen in my job that kind of got me thinking about video in the larger context um, was one, um, this isn't video over email per se, but this is video connection, like how we are right now, literally through Zoom. Yeah, um, sure. That was happening um, at the same time, and that was being rolled out. And one of the things that I was just doing just offhand out of fun was just taking people on virtual tours of my office um, so after like pretty much a discovery call, if they had five minutes left and they're like, oh, you have such a cool looking office, I would literally pick up my laptop and detach it from the dual monitor and walk down yeah. the aisle and say, this is what, you know, the organization looks like and kind of give them like a quick tour of everything. And it was kind of, you know, funny for a while because, you know, in other people's monitors and Zooms, they'll just see this guy walking around with a, <laughs> like, a, wait, a waiter holding like <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then that's kind of where I wanted to like implement stuff like that into <clears throat> like the platforms I was using at the time, bomb bomb. And so, you know, this went from being, you know, like introductory, like trying to get meetings to, you know, I'm going to start making like miniature thought leadership pieces, for example, um, worked with a lot of nonprofits at the time. Um, and basically one of the things that I just made, started making was like, Hey, I, I want to make a two minute video for how we serve nonprofits types of problems that we usually see with them when it comes to their marketing and then like how we go about solving those things. And so it was a way for me to start creating um, like bite, bite sized, really valuable pieces of content that were, took me about two minutes to put together. Maybe I ran through like three slides by sharing my, my screen, but I could share that with a nonprofit in like a value added email now, you know, as another sort of touch point for them yeah. you know, versus just sending out some content that, you know, was just made that I just kind of, fish from my website now I'm a little bit more involved in um, being portrayed as like an industry expert so that's one example there I've even had examples within the selling cycle itself um, to where I would go through a demo <clears throat> but also create a video kind of recapping our, our conversation and even sometimes even highlighting some of those same you know features again um, as well so it's just a great way to like tie together the experiences that I have with customers and you know some new ways of, of sharing information um, and sharing insights. That's so cool. Now, uh, one question I'm sure will be in the mind of some of our viewers and listeners here is: you talked about doing these these thought leadership pieces, right? How did you come up with topics to talk about? How did you figure out what you should say to create these pieces? Yeah, yeah. One of the things I would recommend, um, and I've even learned to do, is um, every time a customer asks a question. I think make it safe to assume that other customers will have that question. And so, you know, if I talk to a nonprofit customer, for example, to keep with that, um, that example, a lot of them would ask, you know, like how are people using this platform? Why should we invest in, in this money? Why should we put money towards stuff like this? And so <clears throat> creating miniature pieces of content around that. So if you have customers now and in, in what you're selling, or if you're in business development, um, you know, really going into like, what are the problems that customers have? And when, if you want to go listen through like call recordings or even ask other people on your team, you know, customers usually always have questions, which is why, you know, we all have talk tracks. You know, if a customer asks this, our talk track is this, you know, if a customer asks, you know, like what, 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 how do I increase my Twitter following? How do I increase my Instagram following? That's specific to that role. Um, but I'm sure in my, my new role, customers will probably ask, you know, how do I you know, split up my inventory this, this way and that way? You know, how should I think about logistics? You know, how should I think about, 
you know, distribution, you know, now I know that customers are asking those types of questions and those are all just miniature videos that I can create yeah. um, to kind of help them and like guide them through that journey and, and, and still be a part of that process without having to get on an, an actual email thread or to jump on a call with someone to walk them through, you know, especially if I have multiple calls in a day and I'm just saying the same thing to everyone and answering, yeah. that. you know, it's a bigger question at, at large. Yeah. That's awesome. So as you were getting started doing all this video stuff and it's, you know, it sounds like it was all, it was all brand new to you. Um, did you find that fairly easy to get yourself on camera or was that kind of a, a hurdle for you to get past? That's a good question. Um, because <clears throat> Parts of, in terms of like how I was introduced to video, um, as I mentioned before, it was within the greater context of trying to get more client engagement. Um, and so I was already willing to try things that were non-traditional. Um, and then at the same time, it, was, uh, it also occurred while my organization was rolling out Zoom and encouraging people to use video over Zoom. Yeah. And so it just seemed like a, a natural um, marriage, or I guess like something that just came out of that experience. Um, and so, you know, while everyone's organization is not along that path of, of rolling out Zoom or encouraging people to use video, um, that's kind of what's really allowed me to at least take down majority of the confidence concerns when it came to recording over video. Um, I did think about this a little bit more too, in the sense that um, sometimes being afraid to, to go over, to have video over email um, it can sometimes be similar to making phone calls um, and there's in, in terms that there's this issue of like reluctance in a way um, you know like yeah. hey if I if I make this call you know then the customer might be upset you know they might be angry that I called them too many times if I send this traditional email you know then the you know, customer might be upset that I emailed them or they may opt out of the sequence you know if I make this video over email then you know like I'm going to have to spend a lot of time like dressing up my surroundings, dressing up myself, um, and really at the end of the day, um, and I've even kind of noticed this, you would have, I would have client meetings over Zoom, and then clients would show up with their videos on, you know, some of them would be in offices, but also some of them would be like in their house, um, yeah, and on sure. the other end of the spectrum, some of them would be like in their like bedrooms and like the entire room is messy and you know, the lighting's all weird and you know I've even had nightmare zooms where like people were, I'm just like where are you right now please go somewhere else so I've um and then kind of made me think like hey if like if someone is willing to forget the fact that they have a super messy bedroom behind them and just yeah right their video then that means like they really want the information more than they want some sort of like studio experience. And so yeah. as the person on the other side of that, it's really helped me say like, Hey, you know, like I'm definitely going to be professional, but I'm not going to focus so much on the camera angle and the, the video angle and the, the lighting and, you know, the perception of this that I lose sight of the fact that, you know, my clients really want the information and they want a relationship with a, a value, a valuable and, a valuable advisor and to yeah. kind of set those <clears throat> those sort of like more personal qualms aside you know because at the end of the day like the job is to um, one of the things I learned is like sales is a, is, a, is a service that you're doing to someone else um, not necessarily something that you're doing for yourself um, and so like while it may not seem on the surface that the, a lot of those those feelings of you know, how do I overcome this how do I overcome the video you know those are a little bit more of like personal problems for the seller Versus, you know, like, I don't want, I don't want a client to not benefit. Here's an, I guess, here's an example of a client who benefited from when I did do video, um, had a customer sign up for a trial um, and the environment came through and basically I had just had difficulties getting them on the phone. Um, you know, they were just no show to meetings, um, you know, constantly push things out. You know, they're just like, they're also just very self, um, self-directed. You know, they were just like, hey, I'm in here. Um, uh, I see a lot of tabs. I see a lot of stuff. But, you know, what do I do? And so from there, <clears throat> I was just like, hey, you know, but I don't have time to get on the phone. You know, and so basically I was just like, okay, well, I made a video for and saying, hey, here's what I've seen other brands like yours do. Here are like the top three features that I usually show them. You know, let's start here and kind of see what you think about this. 
And if you have more questions, like let's jump on the phone. So it, it took me maybe two minutes to send that video to her. Um, but after she, she watched it, uh, when she had time to, she was able to like develop some sort of proficiency within the software herself. And then ultimately she subscribed after um, doing like a, a longer conversation with me. Um, but after that, she had sent back a feedback survey saying like, hey, you know, I was so confused when I came here, but you know, Jeremy Whitaker sent me this personalized video that allowed me to you know, get on the right path essentially. So now I'm excited to use this software. And so, you know, what if, you know, I was so caught up in the, you know, how do I look today? You know, like I, I don't have a haircut right now. I'm wearing a t-shirt. I can't send this person a video that like I've literally missed a sale. You know, I've literally missed helping this, creating this happy customer who's happy enough to leave a review because I didn't want to engage in, in video. And so I think, you know, like, like thinking more about the upsides of like, that could have, you know, that could happen out of an interaction or, you know, even grander things could happen from that interaction um, versus, you know, like, a, oh, I, you know, I feel so, you know, I don't feel like I'm at my best right now physically, so I, I can't turn on video, you know. Yeah, just imagine, <clears throat> imagine real quick being in the shoes of, you know, that customer. You're interested in this, but you're confused. You don't know what to do. And you feel like there's a lot of potential here, but just overwhelmed. And on top of that, I'm sure she's really busy with other things in her life and her business. She has time to dedicate to this. And then your video shows up. It's a, it's a screen recorder. It sounds like you did a screen recording showing her what she needs to do. Can you imagine in her mind her going, well, this is nice, but Jeremy's haircut is just, whew, he's a few weeks yeah. past due, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. come on, that's not going to happen. Nobody yeah. cares. Yeah. I can't imagine you providing that value to her and her reaction being, ha, is he getting over a cold? His voice sounds kind of stretchy. Yeah. And how many times is he going to say, um, in this video? My God, I don't even want to yeah. finish this thing. Yeah. Right? The, the things that go through your head, right, about, oh, the, again, the lighting, the camera angle, the voice. I said, um, I forgot what I was going to say halfway through and had to, like, you know, rally myself. All those things that I'm sure are running through your head. The recipient doesn't care. You're providing value to them. You're helping them in one way or another. That's what they're focused on. The information you're providing, the way you're making them feel, that's what they care about. Yeah. And it, much to your point, like, the clients, they do these things, too. They say, um, they... Yeah. They don't have time to adjust their webcams. They don't, yeah, they show up, they just show up, you know, like they're, you know, they don't try to create this perfection of, of you know, I, I've never had a client, you know, show up late to a Zoom call. Like, hey, sorry, I'm just trying to, you know, perfect the, the, the perception of this. They're just like, oh, I'm in now. And, you know, sometimes it turns on and they're like really close or, you know, we spend 10 minutes fixing the audio. And so it's just, you know, people just oh, want yeah. to get on video. And there are times when customers just want to get on video, you know, so. Yeah. Well, this, this theme keeps coming up, um, you know, about this letting your guard down and showing the real you type of thing. Um, and honestly, I, 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 through the time I've been here at BombBomb, interestingly enough, I have come to think that video itself isn't really the important part. Video itself isn't where the magic happens. The product that I'm selling people and taking their money for isn't really what's so powerful. What the real power is, is that authenticity, that vulnerability, that mutual letting down of guards and seeing each other as you are, that's what allows the relationship to build. I was actually literally just reading something on LinkedIn last night. So gong.io, it's a great software for like recording meetings and stuff. Um, they went through tons and tons of user data and they analyzed how often salespeople curse in their calls. Um, and what yeah. they actually found is that it, it works best when the prospect curses first and then the salesperson adds in a few curse words. But when that happens, there's a significantly higher chance the sale closes than if nobody curses. Because again, <laughs> when you curse in a call, it's this mutual agreement to let's let down our guard, let's not let down this facade of professionalism, and let's just be real with each other, person to person. And cursing, again, is just one way that comes out. But I think another way that can happen is through this video thing, right? Where you say, hey, this camera angle isn't great, my lighting isn't great, I got, I'm recovering from a cold, but I'm going to let you see me as I am. Um, and the person on the other end, again, kind of reciprocates and says, well, yeah, you know, I also don't have great lighting and my hair looks crazy today, but hey, you can see me as I am and let's just be real people with each other rather than keeping up a wall between us and again, a false face uh, of professionalism. Yeah, yeah. And I, that's a, a really powerful point because like, I feel like that's kind of one of what I really enjoy about video is that there's this element of, of, um, of humanity to it. You know, there's driving a human connection you know, because at the end of the day, you know, if you really wanted to, you can automate a lot of traditional emails. You know, you can have like someone come in, write all the emails for the sales team, the organization, and just send those out via email, you know, but to be able to do things like phone and like have voice over phone, which is, and to be able to, 
you know, do things through video and actually see another human being um, is a kind of an important, like, just part of the, the sales process that just makes people feel more connected to, just more listened to as well. Um, and thus being able to trans transfer more information that's vital. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in your journey with video, whether it's now or when you were getting started, did you have any repeating negative self-talk that you kept running up against when you were using video? Um, kind of back to your point around authenticity. Um, it's just, so from the past, I guess I, I grew up in the city of Philadelphia, then uh, went to college in New Hampshire, um, and kind of being around those two different demographics, um, you can sort of really learn to like navigate different conversations and really build up skills and things like code switching and um, to be able to <clears throat> have conversations with different audiences in a way that <clears throat> like one allows you to really build up a lot of um, like eloquence and then I also studied English literature so I'm just like really enamored with words. Um, so from there there's this sort of idea of you know, when I talk to people and see them on video, they're like, oh, I didn't think, you know, you would look that way kind of from what I've heard. And so like kind of going through life, like, oh, I've, I've sounded one way or I've sounded um, like culturally different from how I appear to be um, was something that <clears throat> I felt like 10% of the, like a small part of me had to almost come to columns with of like, hey, people read my emails and they're kind of worded a certain way. And, you know, they're like, oh, they, they get this one impression you know, they hear me on the phone and how I explain things. They get another, they, you know, it reinforces their, that impression. Then they see me on video and then there's like a, you know, idea of like, oh, I need to like rectify, you know, what I've seen and what I've heard with like who I actually see, you know, because the thing about voice um, and I also like do music and <clears throat> like uh, I mentioned, I study literature is that like voice can on some level be a marker of, of identity, um, you know, a marker of gender, a marker of history. Um, and so I'm a marker of geography, you know, people in Philadelphia say, John, you know, people out here in Chicago have their accents. Uh, yeah, so yeah. it's a sort of a way that like voice itself is, is that, that marker of authenticity, um, which is like a, a powerful element. And then being able to see another person is also a powerful element. So it really led to me, um, authentically just like, embracing like, uh, you know, myself, not really feeling like I need to be one way, um, act one way, be perceived as one way. And that kind of also helped to our, our point earlier of, you know, I'm not really as concerned with perfectionism. You know, I'm okay with, you know, missing a few haircuts, you know, coming in, you know, early to record, to record this conversation, even though it looks like it could be night. And, you know, just going in and saying, hey, you know, I'm a human being, you know, yeah, full of, of contradictions, you know, full of, but I don't, I don't need to resolve those contradictions. You know, I'm a human being who's here authentically, you know, this is who I am and I'm, this is the conversation that I'm here to have. And so that's the, the negative stuff talk in that instance was, you know, like you, I should be this, or I should, you know, like I'm, I'm going to have to find a way to like navigate a, a customer's confusion around this or how they're perceiving me after they, they've heard and, and read and read what I've written to them. So, um, but now I, I, I guess I freely and authentically and then out of self-love um, in a positive way, don't care, you know? And, and so from that standpoint, really allows me to just be my humane, authentic self um, and really focus on serving a client um, and not trying to feel like I need to navigate or negotiate any, anything with, like around identities and conversations. Yeah. So what you just mentioned there has come up in a handful of different interviews, but what's interesting is for everyone, it definitely is different, but there's this idea that we have this professional self that either we really want people to see us as, or that we think people do see us as. And we're almost scared that when they see our videos, the cat will be out of the bag and they'll realize that we're not actually that, right? So for, for some people, uh, a common thing that I hear is, I work with a lot of real estate agents, um, and a lot of real estate agents are like women in their 50s. And if you go to their profile online, I don't know when that photo was taken, but a lot of times it's a photo of them looking like they're 33, right? Where in reality, they're 53. So they have this self online, this professional self, which in their mind is a lot younger and more beautiful than they are now. And they feel like when they get on video, they'll be exposed for actually being older than they look in their pictures, right? Um, for some people, it's a matter of their weight. For some people, it's a matter of their 
confidence and competence. Some people feel like when they get on camera, they turn to an awkward, stuttering, stammering fool who doesn't know what they're talking about and they seem incompetent. Whereas their online presence, they seem like they're smooth and well put together and they got their, you know, they got their act together. So you were describing something similar, right? Where you felt like early on people had this perception of you and you wanted them to keep up that perception. You were afraid if you got on camera, their perception would change and they'd see the real you instead of the, you know, the front of you or the business you. Is that, am I interpreting that right? Yeah, yeah. It's like the, the idea of like professionalism, you know, which I feel like on one level should be something used to empower people, you know, um, can sometimes be the same thing that almost polices you in a way. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, yeah, navigating that aspect of, of the self-talk of <clears throat> I'm, I need to portray myself this way <clears throat> in order to accomplish a result you know when really at the end of the day i just need to bring value to accomplish a result instead of trying to maintain a series of images just because that's that's really hard like not just within video but just in life yeah yeah well i I love that that idea there that my primary focus and job should be to provide value to people not to worry how i'm coming across right and one thing I find interesting is I think all of us as a society mutually have the same thing going on where we all have this professional self that we either know people do see us as and we got to keep the act up or this professional self that we want people to see. But one way or another, we have this professional self that we have to keep up and we're all trying to prop up this image of this professional self scared that people will see what the real us is. And we're all mutually doing this and it's kind of destructive to all of us, <laughs> but we're, it seems like everyone's involved in this trap here, right? We're, we're, we're afraid to let our guard down and be seen as we really are because we feel like the way we really are isn't, isn't good enough, isn't what people want, isn't what people expect. And I feel like that obviously extends way beyond video, right? I mean, that, that mindset of I have to, to keep up and act is far, far extends the world of video. So my question is, and I don't know if this will come across clearly or not, in video, you had to go through the mental, emotional, psychological journey of embracing yourself, use the term self-love, and realizing this is who I am. This is my background. I'm from Philadelphia, right? all of these things you had to really embrace and love and own to be on video. So once you went through that process, did you find that it helped you show up differently in other areas of your life as well, even outside of video? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would definitely say yes. Um, because kind of much to the point we we're making earlier is that, you know, this idea of, of, um, of almost maintaining masks, um, extends well beyond just a professional world. It's just almost any endeavor that, you know, you want to pursue because on some level, the mask provides a, a level of safety, um, a level of familiarity, and you almost don't want to break that, break that mold. You know, so when I'm doing things like uh, writing poems, for example, so I do that outside of work, you know, I, I, you know, there are times where I'm like, oh, well, this doesn't look like a poem to me. This doesn't, this doesn't follow the traditional path that how poems usually are written. And, you know, instead of just saying, oh, well, how do I police this back in? You know, how do I, how do I literally enforce a form on this? You know, why don't I just accept this as it is, accept this as the story that it is. And so it, it helps me with my art, you know, it helps me, um, you know, when it comes to, I guess, back into to work, I should say, or even with relationships, you know, like a, a, a husband should be this, you know, I'm, I was told in all my life that, you know, a, a man should be this, this, this. And instead of trying to figure out how I can negotiate with those masks, um, it's really just a matter of like, I am who I, who I am. And I don't need to, <clears throat> and this kind of goes into some of the things that I personally am, am overcoming is like, um, there's, no, I, there's no right or wrong or no right or wrong answer. You know, if I choose to embrace these things or these identities or these creative tasks, you know, there's, there's really no one to say that's the right thing or the wrong thing other than myself. Um, and so it really kind of, for me, like reinforced um, a lot of the things I was thinking. So even if we started with the idea of video, of like, hey, you know, use video. If someone came to me and said, use video for X, Y, Z. You know, I did use video for X, Y, Z, but I also found that there are other letters in the alphabet. And of that same mentality of, you know, like here are some suggestions versus here are the only instructions that exist, um, if, if that makes sense. 
um, is, is how it's, I've been able to expand this idea of, you know, the email and phone are the only way to reach customers. No, I could use video over email. You know, or these are the only ways to use video over email. No, I can use it in these ways and find more empowerment and results from that. You know, this is the only way to write a poem. This is the only way to sing a song. This is the only way to run a podcast. Like, no, there is no right, right way. There are like suggestions. There are best practices. There are things other people did, you know, to get where they got them. But, you know, there are infinite ways to succeed. There's tons of undiscovered territory, you know, if you were to embark on it just in a different way. And so that's where I think like that experience <clears throat> was a, was a, almost like a small mirror for the larger, the context of, of, of that journey. Yeah. Oh man, so much, so much good stuff there. <laughs> so yes, uh, I absolutely agree that a ton of our unhappiness and problems in life comes from these shoulds, right? These, these rules that we somehow ingest, whether they're taught to us from our parents or just picked up from the side around us, these shoulds, the way I should be and the way my business should be and the way my presence should be and the way profession I should be and the way my parenting should be and all these shoulds that we just feel drowned in. Um, because a lot of times, A, these shoulds aren't even necessarily the best way to do it, but B, mostly these shoulds just aren't the way we naturally operate and the best fit for us. And we're forcing ourselves into some other mold. And I think you're right. A huge bit of happiness and contentment in life can be found from stepping back and saying, forget the shoulds, what works best for me and who am I really? And just show up as you, sometimes you happen to align with the shoulds and sometimes you don't, but in all things you align with yourself and your core, that's, that's freaking huge. So I think, I think you're, you're right. That goes so much further beyond video. Uh, and I'm happy to hear that, you know, your work in video helped you in a step towards that. Something else I've noticed is that a lot of people, when they get started on video, they think what's holding them back is just, I don't like the way I look, right? And these, these kind of surface level things always come up every time, you know, someone's getting started with video. But I honestly think that for a lot of people, what holds them back from really using video is this massive web of shoulds, right? Because again, well, a video should sound like this and a professional should sound like this. And I should have my videos be this long and I should look a certain way and I should speak. It. And they realize when you're on video, it's, it's kind of, and in some ways for some people, it feels like you're a, you're a turtle out of its shell with a bright sun shining on you and crows about to peck on you. Like you're all exposed, right? You can't possibly check the boxes for all those web of shoulds that we have in life when you're on camera when it's a raw, authentic video, one take, no editing, no polish. And a lot of people just aren't comfortable with, again, showing up as they are, despite the fact that they aren't always meeting all of those shoulds that they have in their mind. And that truly is what is holding them back. And it just kind of manifests itself with things like, I don't like my voice, I don't like the way I look. Yeah, and I guess to kind of like as, as a point to that is, um, as a, another way that people kind of interpret the should is, you know, also what are the instructions, you know, really on one level, people want the instructions, you know, they don't want, just want someone, you know, come and say, Hey, use video over email. They also want all of the instructions for how to do this. Um, when really <clears throat> like the best way to succeed a video in terms of like recommendations would be to approach it, you know, with humanity, you know, there aren't, you know, there's not, one way to to be a human you know there are multiple ways to to, to approach this and to kind of embrace that mindset versus um you know if we even took it on to a different format you know and said hey what are what is what is the way to cold call what is the way give me the script give, you know give me the things to overcome the objections i'll just say this and i guess the results will just come and it's like no like each conversation each account is different you know each person you're reaching out to is different there's no like, universal script the same way there's not like a universal video email yeah. strategy so there's not going to be like a set of instructions you know even as you work at a video email provider and seen a variety of use cases that you can provide a client and say this these are the instructions i'm giving you right now it's more of embracing this idea of here is a platform to create to to create more human connection yeah. And to engage, engage clients. And the, the benefit is that there are a number of ways to do that versus a single set, sheet of instructions on what the perfect video like, entails to get you the perfect outcome, even though there are tons of variables between that. That's perfect. I love it. 
So as one kind of final question here, uh, Jeremy, let me ask you this. If I set you down in front of someone across the table and you, I told you that this person was really struggling. They wanted to get on camera. They wanted to use video in their business, but my goodness, they just couldn't make, get themselves up to the point of doing it. What are three things you would tell them right away? Um, one, I would tell them like totally okay. Like one is that the whole point of like being on video is like be yourself, you know, and then you know, you've been yourself this entire time. You know who you are. Um, and so there's no right or wrong way as to how to approach video. And so like getting rid of, to help resolve that concern of like, oh, what if I'm not doing this the right way? It's like, no, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. You know, just jump in, see what you discover versus the giving instructions. Um, two, I would say is definitely as an extension of that, it's like to have fun with video. Like I've sent, sent videos, you know, around Super Bowl and I like, to use the static image to, you know, act like I'm throwing a football and, you know, had all types of, you know, I've seen videos on in other platforms that were, you yeah. know, people were holding up their pets and, you know, so basically, you know, have fun with it as, as well because it's that medium transmits so much information, you know, and, and it really allows you to connect with the person and you can also have fun with it and really be engaging. Um, and I guess the third thing um, from there would also to be, um, you know, as you're using video, you know, don't don't um feel like you need to see all of the results overnight you know um one of the powerful things that i've read just in terms of like experience and even i've, I've read an article from you know i think like gary b and he said like one is greater than zero you know send one video out versus none you know don't get so caught up in terms of you know well some you can create a video and someone might not even watch it and so there's a, like, you have to send multiple videos, you know, you know, if you send one, you know, try sending two, send two, try sending three, like it's a part of a larger, like almost campaign in a way versus like, I'm going to, I'm going to send this one video and expect this dramatic thing to occur. And so I would also mention like, because of that, you know, the stakes are low, you know, it's okay if you, if, if you mess up, it's okay if you don't do this the way you thought, because realistically like one video, like while it could change things, you know, like it's also important that like you use video within the context of other videos and other mediums of communication and, and, and transmitting information. Yeah, no, I would, I would definitely echo that. I think um, one of the things that I've heard is, you know, and who knows, maybe Gary Vee, I'm not sure, but never underestimate the power of one, right? Even if you don't have 10,000 viewers, if you have one viewer that matters, that's important enough. In the context of video email, I always tell my customers when they're signing up with BombBomb, you need to expect that more of your videos will not get watched than will be watched but the power and effect and impact those ones that will get watched will have will more than cover for the time you spent sending the videos that never get watched. Yeah. So yeah, definitely got to have that, that patience in there. Cause yeah, sometimes, sometimes you don't get the engagement you want, whether it's social media or video email, that's pretty common. Yeah. Or just cool. calling well, and getting a voicemail. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jeremy. I actually really, really enjoyed this conversation. I and love where it went. Um, if someone just loved this interview and wants to get to know you better, what are the best ways that they can reach you? Um, probably just through LinkedIn. Um, so I'm, you know, once I get the link, I'll share it with my channels too. And, you know, once you share it with yours, I'll comment in your section, uh, but definitely through LinkedIn, excited to connect and I'm always open to new connections. Perfect. All right. Well, yeah. So it's, this has been a conversation with Jeremy Whitaker. Um, I will probably put a link to your LinkedIn page, uh, in the show notes of the podcast and in the description of the YouTube video so people can find you. Yeah. But thank you very much for your time today. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. Let me know um, when you send this out and I'll be happy to, to share with my, my network too. Perfect. Wow, that was awesome. The, the, the implications there of, you know, getting comfortable with the real you and the way you are rather than getting caught up in all these shoulds of life, I can tell you that is a huge, huge thing to, to, to do, right? I mean, it's difficult to do, but the payoffs and satisfaction and happiness and peace and all these things that we all want in life, I can tell you that is a huge part of what's causing a lot of unhappiness for a ton of people is feeling like they have to live up to this massive world of shoulds rather than just being comfortable showing up and saying, this is who I am. In some ways I align with those shoulds and in some ways I don't, but that's okay. It's who I am. And getting comfortable on video and putting yourself out there on video like it was for Jeremy, and I would say like it's been for me, can be a really big part in that journey. A part of saying, you know what, this is me. 
And as you get comfortable with doing that on camera, you'll start finding yourself getting comfortable with doing that in other areas of your life as well. So this has just been an awesome interview and I really hope uh, you guys took a lot away from it, but that was definitely the, uh, the big takeaway for me here.